Stay hungry, stay foolish. Today's guest argues that it was cooking that caused the extraordinary transformation of our ancestors from ape-like beings to Homo erectus. At the heart of this episode lies an explosive new idea. The habit of eating cooked rather than raw food permitted the digestive tract to shrink and the human brain to grow, help structure human society, and created male-female division of labor. As our ancestors adapted to using fire, humans emerged as the cooking apes. Covering everything from food labeling to raw food faddists, Catching Fire offers a startling original argument about how we became to be the social, intelligence, and sexual species we are today. A fundamental question that every culture answers in a different way, but only science can truly decide, and one today's guest deeply explored, is what made us human. Our guest's work proposes a new answer. He is a true changemaker driven by curiosity and believes the transformative moment that gave rise to the genus Homo one of the great transitions in the history of life stemmed from the control of fire and the advent of cooking meals. We welcome the author of Catching Fire, How Cooking Made Us Human, Richard Rangham. Welcome to the show. Well, thank you very much, Aidan. Nice to be with you. Before we explore the origins of us as humans, I thought we should share your origins right back to when you were a research student with Jane Goodall. Yes, I had the incredible good fortune to spend a year working as a research assistant in Gombe National Park in Tanzania, where Jane Goodall was doing her chimpanzee observations. And as a result of that year, I was able to go back and do my PhD studying the feeding behavior of chimpanzees. So I just watched everything chimpanzees ate, and it made a big impact on me. Yeah, and I loved what you talk about. Sometimes you forgot to bring your sandwiches or prepare your sandwiches. So you just mimicked the feeding habits of the chimpanzees. And that was the driver of this curiosity that led you to this brilliant piece of work. Yes, I don't want to claim too much here, you know, because what happened was that here we are with our closest living relatives in an environment in which they are doing well, eating foods that on the whole, uh, it's possible to eat um, without feeling too sick. Uh, you know, some of them are a bit noxious. But nevertheless, um, I, I would sometimes, partly because I've forgotten to take food with me, find myself trying to survive on what the chimpanzees were eating. But uh, in the end, what I realized was that it was simply not good enough. And I just uh, was so happy in the evening to come back and eat a big bowl of you know, mashed potato or pasta or whatever it would be. Uh, and the, the, the reason I say that I don't want to claim too much is that I think it took me something like 20 years before the penny dropped. And I thought, oh, you know, there's a big difference between what chimpanzees are eating and what I'm eating. <laughs> it's, it's raw versus cooked. Well, let's explore that penny dropping moment, because you've written this brilliant piece of work that covers so much, as I mentioned in the intro. I'd love if you gave us a brief overview of our fossil record and indeed the transition first signaled 2.6 million years ago by sharp flakes dug from Ethiopian rock. The big story of human evolution is that for about 2 million years, just a little less than 2 million years, uh, we have had ancestors who looked like us in the sense that uh, they uh, were upright uh, and about our body size and uh, were clearly not very good at climbing because they had our basic uh, shape. So in other words, uh, you could imagine them going down Main Street and being able to walk into a clothing shop and get uh, clothes off the peg to fit them. Now, before then, uh, our ancestors were uh, certainly able to walk upright and probably did so uh, normally when they were on the ground, but they were also good at climbing. So they had much stronger arms and uh, really mobile shoulders, uh, and they, they were like a chimpanzee standing upright. And so this was a huge difference, and the difference is marked by calling us the genus Homo, initially Homo erectus, or maybe Homo habilis, uh, not Homo sapiens until quite recently, until about uh, 200, 300,000 years ago. So the big question for understanding what happened to make us human is what happened to change uh, basically an ape standing upright into uh, an early primitive kind of human. This, this happened uh, just around 
two million years ago. Already, as you noted, there had been some use of stone flakes for uh, doubtless a variety of activities, which would have included uh, cutting some meat off bones, uh, but probably also uh, shaping uh, wooden sticks, that sort of thing. So the tool use came first, uh, and then later, around two million years ago, we became the first members of the genus Homo. The question is why? And as you say, according to the most popular view since the 1950s, there was a single supposed impetus, which was the eating of meat. And people rested their hat on that one. But evidence of cooking was bodily adaptations, for example, less adept at climbing, trading shoulders, intestines, and teeth for brain, evidenced by us sleeping on the ground, not in caves. And the only way to do that, as you discovered, was fire. Yes, I think there are two big reasons for thinking that fire must have been the critical breakthrough, control of fire, uh, that made us human. Uh, and uh, one is the one you mentioned, uh, which is that at that point we became committed to sleeping on the ground because uh, it's quite clear that uh, we could not do what chimpanzees, gorillas, uh, bonobos, and apes do, uh, which is if they need to, to climb into the trees to be able to sleep. Um, when we lost those climbing adaptations, then we committed ourselves to sleeping in an area on the ground that would have been extremely dangerous. I mean, nowadays, you know, the thought of just going to sleep in uh, the Serengeti or you know, some place full of uh, a community of carnivores like lions um, and just, just lying down on the ground at night with no fire is absolutely terrifying. It wouldn't happen. It's only when you've got fire that you'd be prepared to, uh, to sleep on the ground. And the second big reason uh, is what happened with the gut. Uh, and when I say the gut, I mean all the way from uh, the mouth uh, through our digestive system. And what happened was that uh, everything got smaller. Uh, the, um, the mouth got smaller, the teeth got smaller, uh, and to judge from the arrangements of the bones, uh, the actual uh, gut, the intestine, uh, became reduced by maybe as much as a, a third. And some people have argued that this has got something to do with meat eating, but uh, the changes in the shape of the teeth uh, really don't bear that out because uh, the, the teeth were sort of rather small and, and rounded, you know, quite unlike uh, what you see in uh, animals that are adapted to eating meat. So they have very, very sharp, shearing teeth. And um, these, the only reasonable uh, explanation for uh, what happened with the uh, gut, as evidenced by the bones and the teeth, is that we were eating soft, easily digested food. And the only reasonable um, uh, kind of food that would be is uh, food that was cooked. So this combination of commitment to sleeping on the ground and a commitment to eating soft, digestible food, I think speaks very strongly to uh, the fact that this must have been the time at which humans became able to control fire so predictably that they could adapt uh, to, to using it. And one of the reasons, by the way, for saying that is that whenever this happened, uh, whenever uh, humans did learn to control fire and in such a predictable way that, that uh, they could do it always, uh, then there's no question it would have had huge effects on uh, their biology. And what's so fascinating is that there is no subsequent time, subsequent to two million years ago, uh, when this is signaled. In other words, there is no uh, point at which our anatomy changes in a way that suggests that all of a sudden we stopped eating raw food and at cooked food. So two million years ago, with the evolution of Homo erectus, is really a time that it's very difficult to see how it could be anything other than the point when our ancestors first controlled fire, and that meant that an ape became a human. What I love about this is we're in a world of mass technological change and fire was a technology and it had a massive impact then on society, not only physically for people or biologically, 
but also on the impact on society itself, how we operated, for example. And I love the way you write this. There's seismic shifts were enabled by the hunt for meat. For example, and I quote this from the book, teamwork might have been necessary with some individuals in a hunting party throwing rocks to keep fearsome animals at bay, while others quickly cut off hunks of meat before all retired to eat in a defensible site. So it is easy to imagine that the rise of meat eating fostered various human characteristics such as long distance travel, bigger bodies, rising intelligence, and most importantly, increased cooperation. And it's something that we're seeing in society today, driven by technology, that there is a need for more cooperation and coopetition in a world of increasing complexity. I really like that comparison that we see there. But I'd love if you took us through, for example, the man, the hunter hypothesis and how it's incomplete. To me, the big feature that is missing in uh, the whole idea of meat eating is that we're not adapted to eating our meat raw. If you actually do a survey of uh, the number of people who eat their meat raw, people living in, in uh, as hunters and gatherers or small scale society, you see essentially the only people who ever do it, and even there it's very rare, is in the Arctic, where cooking is tremendously difficult. And what happens is that men who are out hunting for a day go to a cache where they have previously hidden some food, dig it up and get some of the meat. But when they get home in the evening, they absolutely insist that their wives have produced a great soup or a roast or whatever it is uh, uh, cooked uh, painfully slowly on seal oil flames. If you go to the tropics, nobody ever eats their meat raw. And there's good reasons for that. Uh, you know, it's uh, both rather irksome to be able to chew your way through raw meat. It takes a long time. And, of course, it's dangerous because bacteria can easily get on it and, and it's dangerous for you. This all means that to think that humans could have been well adapted to meat eating prior to being able to cook it, it's, it's, it's impossible to imagine, really. And then you talk about how long apes and chimpanzees, primates, have to spend eating all day. I mean, they're chewing for a very long time. And you say this is kind of akin to a raw diet because you're constantly eating because you're constantly hungry because there's a lack of energy from that food. Yes, I mean, it's so fascinating, you know, that when we compare our diets with those of the primates, people have often said, well, you know, we can eat fruit, uh, we can eat meat, uh, we, can, we can eat almost everything we do eat, we can eat it raw. Uh, and so why don't we do that? Well, there's an answer to, to why don't we do that, and that is that it takes a tremendous amount of time. When people go out to see chimpanzees for the first time, you know, what they're hoping to do is to see some of the fascinating observations that come from Jane Goodall and others, such as uh, using tools or doing some sort of fancy social things. But actually, the great majority of the time, what you see is they're eating. Because if you are committed to eating raw wild food, in order just to get enough calories per day as a species like humans or chimpanzees, you have to spend many hours per day, totally unlike people. So uh, chimpanzees that I studied in, in Gombe with Jane Goodall, they were chewing, literally just chewing, about six hours per day. If you look at people around the world, whether they are in uh, USA or Europe or in small-scale societies, hunters and gatherers, you find the same thing, which is that people literally chew less than an hour a day. That is because their food is cooked and it is relatively soft and easily mashed up and swallowed. It's just very difficult eating raw food. Of course, you know, many people have a funny idea about raw food because what they're thinking of is things like apples and bananas, which are the product of culture. You know, people say bananas are nature's perfect food. And they're wrong, because bananas are culture's perfect food. They are the result of eons of selection by people for a food that has been developed and evolved as a result of artificial selection. If you eat wild foods, you find that they are tough, they are full of fibrous strands, uh, they're often full of rather bitter or stringent or other kind of difficult tasting compounds, 
And the net result is that you have to spend a lot of time chewing away to get a little value. So there's a huge difference uh, once you eat your food cooked. And uh, basically in humans, we would be saving ourselves uh, several hours a day, probably five, six, seven hours a day of chewing. Well, what a difference does that make to what we can do in life? You can be inventing all sorts of technology. You can be polishing your weapons. You can be going out on patrol. You can take risky ventures, uh, spending hours per day trying to get meat and uh, not necessarily succeeding if you have all this free time afforded by the fact that you cook your food. In the view of many evolutionary anthropologists, the pressure for intelligence comes from the advantages of outwitting social competitors, whereas a major reason for species differences is how much brain power the body can afford. And I thought this was really interesting, the fact that because we had new energy, because we now had extra calories versus primates, for example, our bodies in their wisdom didn't put that energy into being a better climber or having a better digestive system. That energy was powered into the brain, 2.5% of our body mass, 20% of our energy intake. So the brain developed, and that's where we became king of the species so far. Yes, you are so right. You know, it's an enduring puzzle as to why it is that, to judge from the size of the skulls, starting about two million years ago, just before, in fact, uh, you get a pretty continuous rise in the size of the brain. And what we know of the density of neurons in human brains compared to the brains of our close relatives, the apes, it suggests that the rise in the size of, of the brain um, was uh, pretty much uh, exactly mirrored by a rise in the uh, number of neurons and the complexity of the uh, neuronal networks. In other words, uh, all the things associated with intelligence. And uh, so why did this happen? Or why didn't it happen with other species, this uh, astonishing continuous rise? And I wouldn't say that the answer is you know, fully known yet, but it sure seems as though a critical part of the solution is the question of how you can afford to fuel the brain, as you were saying, because the brain is not only a very expensive tissue, but it is also a tissue that you have to continuously fuel. If you stop fueling your brain, then you die. You know, it's not like a computer. You don't turn the brain off at night. <laughs> the metabolic activity has to continue. So you have to be able to reserve a portion of the metabolic energy of the body as a whole for the brain. And as you intimated, that is an astonishingly large amount because we have a sufficiently big brain with its big needs that uh, basically every fifth hamburger that you eat is just used for the brain. You know, 20 or, or more percent of your total nutritional intake, your calorie intake. And so the fact that what cooking does is to substantially increase the amount of calories that you can take in uh, it seems very significant. Now, one of the ways in which you can think about this is the trade-off between uh, the uh, energy apportioned to different parts of the body. The gut is another pretty expensive organ in terms of its use of calories. But our guts are something like one third smaller than they are in cousin apes. And that's because we have evolved to be able to take advantage of an easily digested food that doesn't require such hard work by the guts. Well, that means that we are saving ourselves lots of energy that would otherwise go to maintaining those guts and driving those guts. And that energy can be used for making the brain bigger. So there's various ways in which you can think of the consequences of cooking with its reduced need to fuel the gut and its increased availability of energy as supporting the larger brain. And I think one way to think about it is that our cooking just got probably uh, better and better and more efficient at uh, producing calories over the last two million years. 
And we've been able to just get continuously bigger brains during that time and just get smarter and smarter. And one of those benefits was social alliances or cooperation. And as you say, most animals are not up to the cognitive challenges of juggling social alliances, but the exceptions are telling. For example, you mentioned the link of sociality to mental power found in social insects. I thought this was fascinating. You mentioned particularly ants and wasps. Yes, it's remarkable the, the comparisons one can find uh, uh, across the animal kingdom. So uh, the great peak of sociality in the invertebrates is the, the social insects uh, like ants, bees and wasps. And uh, it turns out that they do apportion a bigger part of their body to their nerve networks, their kind of little brains, than species that are less social. So there does seem to be some kind of broad relationship between sociality and brain power. And that makes sense because in order to be effectively social, what you need to do is to evolve individuals that can live together in peace. And at the same time, you have tremendous competition among those individuals with all that opportunity to form alliances and help each other and compete with each other. So the the ones who are just a little bit more intelligent are the ones who are going to be able to succeed in, in evolutionary competition. I mean, you mentioned also the variation in gut size, which is linked to the quality of diet, but also that large guts take energy away from the brain. So they're expensive from an energy perspective, which also explains how our brain and gut fight with each other after a rich lunchtime meal, for example, and we experience that mid-afternoon slump. This is the bones of the expensive tissue hypothesis. The expensive tissue hypothesis is the one that, starting in 1995 with uh, Leslie Aiello and Peter Wheeler, they pointed out this inverse relationship that you find among the primates in general. The ones that have the smallest guts have the biggest brains. They pointed out this logic that I was just recounting, that uh, you can shift the energy that you would apply to your guts if you, if you need big guts. You have to supply them with energy. But if you have small guts, you can shift the energy to some other organ. And in species in which social competition is tremendously important because you live in groups, then you shift it towards the brain and uh, you get a, a smarter, smaller gutted species as a result. That's exactly what we are. And Richard, you know, mentioned earlier on about raw foods and raw foods giving less, less energy. And in particular, you mentioned the Evo diet. I thought this was interesting because in a world where people are mentioned about being vegetarian, you're hearing a lot about this. There's a Netflix documentary called Game Changers, for example, that's spoken about a lot. And it was about moving to a vegetarian diet. And I thought this was interesting in the backdrop of your book, because the energy needed to feed the brain and the amount of energy expended in digesting raw food is really important consideration. And here the Evo diet showed that there are effects, impacts on the body and on reproduction, for example, when we don't eat enough calories and we don't eat cooked food. Yes. One of the very remarkable things that I encountered when I started doing this work was a resistance to the idea that there is any kind of fundamental difference in calorie gain from eating food cooked or eating it raw. And at one level, one can understand why people are resistant to that. So for instance, you might go to this published nutritional data. Uh, if you go to the website of the US Department of Agriculture, they show, I think it's about 8,000 foods there uh, with nutritional characteristics. And you can take pairs of foods. You can take uh, carrots uh, eaten raw or carrots that are cooked or some quality of some cut of meat eaten raw or eaten cooked. And what you will tend to find is that the data say that you get the same number of calories per gram, whether it is raw or cooked. Now, the reason that that, that is said is because the way in which calories are indexed is by essentially blowing up the meat. This is done in a thing called a bomb calorimeter. What you do is you assess the number of calories in the meat 
by seeing what happens uh, when it essentially is on fire. Uh, of course, the great difficulty with, with those sorts of data is that that is not the way that the, the, uh, the body digests food. It doesn't blow the, the food up. It digests by applying enzymes, by a lot of muscular action in the body, by actually uh, having, you can say, maybe 25 different digestive processes that reduce the chunk of food uh, into the molecules that are actually converted uh, and, and absorbed uh, in your blood. And the point about all those digestive processes is they cost energy. And if you eat your food cooked, then it costs much less for the body to get the nutrients into the blood than if you eat your food raw. So uh, that is one major feature that means that the sheer measurement of calories per gram using a bomb calorimeter uh, is an inadequate way of assessing the calorie value of a food that is actually eaten cooked versus eaten raw. The second, so that, that is concerned with the cost of digestion. The second reason that food eaten cooked is more valuable to you than food eaten raw is that a higher proportion of the nutrients are actually digested in the body when it is eaten cooked. So raw food can pass through the body totally undigested in some cases, uh, like starch grains that just are never broken down by the body. Or the raw food can pass through the small intestine, which is where food is digested most efficiently, and then get into uh, the large intestine, and which is where our microbiome is, and then it can be converted by the microbiome. But the thing about conversion by the microbiome is that we only get about half of the nutritional value of the nutrients when they are fermented by bacteria in the microbiome. So if the food is eaten raw, then less of it is digested in the small intestine, more of it is either undigested or is fermented by the microbiome, in which case we get less value of it. The net result of these processes is that people who are eating their food totally raw get so much less calories from their diet that if they are women, they do not have enough calories on average to be able to maintain their reproductive function. In other words, half of the women on a raw food diet will turn out to stop menstruating. And this, of course, is fascinating from the point of view of thinking about our evolutionary biology, because that means they cannot reproduce. It means that the raw foodists are not well adapted. And this is despite the fact that the raw foods that these raw foodists who have been measured in this way, the raw foods that they are eating, are very high-class foods. They are the energy-rich agricultural foods like apples and oranges and bananas. And not only that, they are foods that are processed very often in electric blenders. They are foods also that come from all around the world so that there's no period of the winter or the dry seasons when they are forced to eat really low quality foods because they can get their foods from wherever is producing the best foods at that particular season. Even under all these wonderful conditions that uh, mean that we now live in this lap of luxury, even under those conditions, the average woman eating raw food cannot have a baby. So there is this enormous difference in the calorie gain that we get from eating our foods raw and cooked, which means that we are the only species on earth that has this unique constraint. We are adapted to eating our food cooked. We cannot survive on eating it raw in the wild. We have become a different kind of species, completely reliant on cooking. You mentioned their food labeling. I think this is really important to call out because I haven't seen it called out this way. That makes absolute scientific sense. 
So on the show, we often discuss how conventions still used in our world today are out of date. For example, org structures in a business or management styles. But a word on nutritional informational labeling here, as you say in the book, for more than a century, the convention that has dominated estimating energy values in foods and now underpins the food labeling system in the Western world has been the Atwater system. And Wilbur Atwater, who invented it, was born in 1844. (laughs) But it has two critical problems that undermine its ability to assess the food value of items of low digestibility, whole grain flour with large particles. And I thought this was really interesting because these factors need to be considered. We need to update the system in order to consider the way food has evolved as well. So food has evolved, for example, finely milled flours, the new flours that we have developed in bread, etc. These all have a massive impact, but we're still using the same labeling system developed back in the 19th century. Yes. Uh, so you go into a, a supermarket and the calories per gram that are on the food labels are measured without taking into account the digestibility of the food or the cost of digesting it. So the net result is that uh, you do not realize that food that is more finely processed or has been more heat treated in its production is going to give you more calories than sort of fresh original food that has not been processed. That just doesn't come through. I think there are tragic results. One of the tragic results is that People think that raw food is good enough. And for adults, well, that just means that maybe people get hungry. But for children being brought up on a raw food diet, this is really dangerous. And there are cases from time to time where people with the best of intentions bring their children up on a raw food diet, and uh, this can even lead to them dying from starvation. It ought to be against the law. But even without that happening, it ought to be that we would have a system where people are much more aware of the calorie difference between foods eaten raw and foods eaten cooked. So that's right. We need a new system. There are some groups that draw some attention to this. So Weight Watchers uh, has uh, drawn some attention to the fact that more finely processed foods will give you a greater calorie gain. Uh, And of course, the irony nowadays is that for most people, the way in which an improved knowledge of the calorie density of foods, you know, the real calorie gain that you get from them, the way in which this would help most people is by allowing them to eat fewer calories rather than more, because so, so many of us struggle with maintaining our weight or trying to reduce it. But either way, whether or not you're trying to gain weight or you're trying to lose it, it would be better if we had a a more realistic system of informing each other about how many calories you're going to get from your food. And I thought this was interesting from an innovation perspective. You said researchers know precisely what secretions are applied to food molecules at each point in their journey down the elementary canal. They can say which chemical bonds are severed, by which enzyme, at which point, how the cells and membranes carry the products of digestion across the gut wall, and how mucosal cells respond to changing pH or mineral concentrations. The detail of biochemical knowledge is exquisite, but we're not tapping into it. For example, we could use technology here, the whole idea of nanotechnology inside the gut to tell us what food is best for me if I'm digesting it well. So we can individualize and personalize diets to certain body types, to certain digestive tracts, all this kind of stuff comes to the fore. The way in which the nutritional textbooks think about food is dominated by biochemistry. And of course, the biochemistry is very important and it's wonderful what advances have been made in understanding the biochemistry. What we need, though, what is totally missing from most of these sorts of books is the biophysics. So in other words, the domination of this area by thinking about biochemistry is so great that there is essentially no difference in the perception of food quality between a hunk of, say, raw meat and a solution of amino acids and proteins that are identical biochemically to what you see in the meat, but are just converted into a liquid. But in fact, there's a huge difference in terms of 
digestion and the calorie gain because much of the meat is just going to be very hard work for the body to digest. You've got to break it down into tiny little molecules, break the fat down into tiny little globules, and all of that takes work. So in order to be able to understand really how our bodies get and use food, we have to think of the physical state in which the food is presented to the body because it has a great impact on how many calories we end up getting from the food. And one of the things I just wanted to come back to was because we didn't have to spend up to six hours per day chewing to energize the body, we were now able to energize the brain. And you say it was questionable whether the sexual division of labor would have been possible at all without, while eating raw foods because of how long it took to hunt or to gather, to chew and digest. But fire here solved this problem. I'd love to delve into this because this brings us into the whole sexual division of labor and how sociological momentum takes a very long time to develop and therefore takes a long time to shift into a whole new momentum. Sexual division labor is so interesting. It is as rigid uh, with cooking as it is with anything. Uh, that is to say, if you survey all of the societies of the world, you find that the domestic cooking is always done by women. There are exceptions when you come to public ceremonies, where in many societies, the men will turn out for the day and do the equivalent of fixing the, the barbecue, maybe all join together in the middle of the village and ostentatiously produce some terrific roast. But day to day, it's always the women who are doing the cooking. And from someone who studied chimpanzees, the whole phenomenon of the sexual division of labor is kind of really striking because you might get slight sex differences in what is eaten. So chimpanzee males eat a little bit more meat than chimpanzee females do. But there is no division of labor because there is no kind of coordination of a thing called labor. It's not as if a male and a female share a task and combine to produce something together, a meal, uh, which is what happens in humans. So where does this come from? I am very impressed by the fact that once you have cooking, then you have a new kind of problem for the individuals who are organizing their food because anybody who cooks their food and therefore improves it is vulnerable to having their food stolen. And that is because when you cook, it takes time to be able to prepare the food. It may take 10 minutes, it may take half an hour, it may take longer. And during that time, uh, you're vulnerable to somebody else who is bigger and tougher than you coming along and pinching the food that is on the fire. And to make matters worse, smoke has got a strong smell and it's easy for people to figure out when somebody is cooking. So you're vulnerable. Um, I think that the deep dynamic behind the sexual division of labor involves the fact that men are physically stronger uh, and maybe more socially organized than women, and that as a result, men are in a position to be able to take advantage of uh, women's cooking. And you sometimes see stories of this uh, in the ethnographic literature where a woman is cooking and a man just comes along, a bachelor, say, and then takes uh, food from her fire. She screams at him and objects royally. And then what happens? Well, then what happens is that she tells her husband that some lousy bachelor came along and pinched one of her roots. And the husband then talks to the other men, the other husbands, and they all get together and confront the thief and tell him to mend his ways. And he does. Uh, and, and if he doesn't, then there's going to be real trouble and he may get beaten or worse. So you've got a system in which women are vulnerable, but they have a system of protection. And that system of protection uh, involves them being able to use the community of husbands as an alliance to protect themselves. Once you've got this, then the men are in a wonderful position because they can predict that they can, as a result of this alliance, rely on wives to produce their food for them. And that means they can go off and spend hours per day doing all sorts of other stuff. And that other stuff will include 
both contributing to the family needs through hunting, but it can be other things as well. They can go off looking for girlfriends or sitting under a tree gambling or going off to some religious ceremony somewhere or, or whatever it is they want to do. I'm making light of it in some ways, but of course, in some ways, this is rather a horrid story because it's kind of a, an exploitation by men of women's labor. And it's a story that you see repeated in society after society. And I think ultimately it comes from the fact that fire enables people to be very efficient in the production of food, but also very vulnerable to these forms of social competition. The worldwide pattern of women as the cook and man as the hunter is reflected in the English language itself. And you tell us this, the word lady is derived from the old English, and I'm going to butcher this word, but halaftiga, meaning bread kneader, whereas the word lord comes from half weird, which means bread keeper. I thought that was really interesting. And the reason I bring that up is to highlight how sociological momentum takes a very long time to develop and therefore it takes a long time to unwind and often needs other drivers to help it. And taking the sexual division of labor, for example, the man works or hunts while the woman cooks at home and drivers of today, like convenience food, like reversal of roles, play a part, but the shift towards gender equality in the workplace will take time. Yeah, I mean, I think it is a great point. And, you know, at one level, as we see women increasingly coming into uh, senior roles in whether it's politics or business or the arts or whatever, one can imagine that is this is merely the result of social awareness and appreciation for, for human rights and appropriate attitude towards the lack of differences between men and women. But at another level, I think what you're pointing to is absolutely right, which is that in societies in which you have the traditional and necessary commitment to cooking on a daily basis, whether it's around an open fire or whatever kind it is, the system works against women because women are literally committed to a tremendous amount of time in the kitchen or the equivalent. And it's the fact that nowadays, either we have cooking that is very much easier to do at home because of all the modern conveniences, as well as the fact that food is often prepared for us by the shops in a way that makes it easy to cook, or that the food is um, not cooked at all because we're eating out or uh, uh, ordering in the pizza or, or whatever it is. So these very practical aspects that reduce the total amount of time that uh, women have to spend in preparing food are hugely important in freeing women to be able to join men in all of the activities that have traditionally been dominated by men. And why have they been dominated by men? Because men have been freed by the fact that they rely on women to cook for them. So men have lots and lots of time on their hands. And they can be the poets and the scientists and the politicians and the businessmen and so on. I think this is so important to highlight this because oftentimes people just highlight unfairness. Yes, it is unfair, but it's built in biologically. It's culturally built in. And I was fascinated by one of your many interviews where you looked at how male and female leadership styles are very different based on that blend of biology and culture. Yes, there was Obama the other day talking about the fact that it would probably be a better world. It wouldn't, still wouldn't be a perfect world, but it would probably be a better world if, if women were in charge, uh, were, were politically dominant. That seems absolutely right. I mean, the, a very big difference between men and women is that there is a persistence of competition for status and willingness to use risk among men that remains dangerous in a way that is less true for women. You know, women certainly can be war leaders and take uh, male-like decisions. But overall, uh, it seems very clear that uh, willingness to take big risks is muted in women uh, in general, because according to the way people tend to think about this, women's attitudes towards conflict is that the most important feature is to be alive in order to look after your children, basically, um, whereas men are prepared to, uh, to take wild risks because if they have huge gains, uh, then they're able to translate them into power, which can lead to huge numbers of wives and, and big families and so on. Um, 
whereas for uh, women, it makes sense to be able to take leadership decisions that keep themselves alive for the sake of their children. I mean, that's, that's getting a long way down into the, uh, the sort of fundamental psychological differences. But the argument is that these kinds of differences would ultimately play out at the political level as well in general. Yeah, I think it's fascinating how that will play out in our society today where there is so much ego in leadership and hopefully we're seeing a dispersion of that. And as we see more and more female leaders coming in, for example, Finland has just brought in a whole raft of female leadership we're seeing in New Zealand and therefore very, very different leadership styles and very considered and empathetic leadership styles, not driven by ego. But I found a beautiful analogy I thought I'd finish on today. Richard, which is in the book, you say almost all hunts by chimpanzees follow a chance encounter during such routine activities as patrolling their territorial boundaries, suggesting that chimpanzees are unwilling to risk spending time on a hopeful search. And I thought this was really interesting from an innovation perspective, because we have outsourced digestion to fire. This is the origin of this. We had more time to explore. Therefore, we had more time to leave the caves in which we dwelled and to push the boundaries of, of society, of experimentation, and therefore of innovation. Yes. Once we learned to control fire, everything changed. And the distribution of time was a huge part of that. If you are a chimpanzee, you like to eat meat, but the average duration of a hunt is only 20 minutes. And the reason that it is so relatively short is because if they fail, then they're going to get hungry And in order to be able to get enough food, they have to revert to their standard method of feeding, which is just just going to be in the trees and eating fruit. They can't afford the extra time to go and play with things like hunting for long periods. Then we start cooking. And all of a sudden, you instead of spending six hours a day eating, you're spending one hour a day eating. You've got five hours available to be able to do all sorts of innovative stuff. And that is a huge part of what made us human. One last thing, you finished the book on this, and I think this is really important. In any new abundance comes a new scarcity. And one of the scarcities that happens in a world of data abundance is there's so much information out there that there's a scarcity of trust. But equally, and this is why I think this book is so important, because you've gone after science, you've gone after real hard data to show this information, to display this information. And as you say, and you finish the book on, those of us lucky enough to live with plenty, the challenge has changed. We don't have to chase energy anymore, but now we must find ways to make our ancient dependence on cooked food even healthier. And that is the new challenge. Yes, you know, all these years in our evolutionary past, uh, we have been in lineages like every other animal, desperate to try and solve the problem of hunger. We have lived to get extra bits of calorie. And all of that has changed in the last few decades. We have solved the problem so well that our new problem is to get fewer calories into our bodies. And it's by understanding what cooking does to the foods that we can get new principles for thinking about how to develop a wise kind of nutrition. And all of a sudden, it actually is a good thing to eat your food raw if what you're trying to do is to lose weight. So, you know, I'm totally on board with Michael Pollan and people like him who say that we should try and revert to eating uh, more real foods, more whole foods, in other words, less processed foods, and more raw foods. Because if we have a problem with overweight, we can go back and reverse the evolutionary clock, as it were, and become uh, raw food eaters again. And that'll make us healthier. Richard, where can people find out more about your work? Well, the book is Catching Fire, published in 2009 by Basic Books. One of the things just to say is innovation and education go hand in hand. And I got such an education from your work. And it's been a real pleasure having you on the show. Author of Catching Fire, How Cooking Made Us Human, Richard Rangham, thank you so much for joining us. Boy, you had the best questions. I love the way that you bring in real quotes from the book and so on. I just thought that was a great interview. 
Thank you so much, man. And I wish you a very happy Christmas. And thanks for producing such great work. All the best to you and many thanks.